Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Lee Markosian. Um, Lee has an unusual background for a computer scientist. He did his bachelor's in English uh, back in 1981. Then he worked as a short order cook and a, uh, and a counselor to the mentally retarded while he was also a writer and a, and a performer with a group of nouveau Dadaists. And he can tell you about that, I guess, if there's enough time at the end. <laughs> Save your questions. And um, then he got certified in, uh, in teaching and taught high school mathematics. And then finally went and did a master's and then a PhD at Brown University. Um, and today he'll be talking about a subject that's very close to my own heart, art-based rendering for computer graphics. OK. Thanks, David. You're welcome, Lee. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think when the talk was advertised, I used a slightly different title, art-based modeling. But from my point of view, it's almost the same thing in that I'm concerned with the, the person who's trying to create the scene from scratch in the first place, who has to model the scene in some sense, and the computer's going to render it. So I'm not making a big distinction there. And I have a subtitle here saying, realism in graphics means having to supply a bazillion bits of data and get them all right. So again, where I'm coming from with this is from the point of view of the scene designer. And the, uh, a big part of the point of, of the the problem I've been working on is to address that problem of the person who's going to be making the graphics. There's also the question of the person who's going to be looking at the graphics. So, so here's an example. This is from uh, The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. So I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people recognize this. Um, and we can see it doesn't look anything like a photograph of a comparable scene. You, you can imagine a photograph of, of a landscape with grass, trees, bushes, sky. And you can imagine with, with a detailed photograph, there's going to be an awful lot of information there. Now, you, could, you can also imagine, this has been done, create such a scene in, in, as a 3D graphic model and then rendering that. And to do that realistically, which has been done, it requires a huge amount of data. And part of the point of going with non-photorealism is that it's, there's a lot less there. There's, so it's, it's essential, inherently, there's so much less that has to be specified, and that can, has the potential, at least, to make it much easier to do. Now, that's part of the reason why Dr. Seuss chooses this style. He has to, make, he has to turn out these books, or at least he did when he was working. And uh, you can imagine trying to do such a, you know, trying to produce realistic images every time is going to be extremely time consuming. And the same thing carries over to the computer doing the work. Now, of course, the other reason for going with such a style is that apparently these types of images uh, are, do a better job of appealing to the target audience. So if you look at children's books, it's almost all the time they seem to be hand-drawn or painted images. So here's another example uh, from a comic book by Charles Burns. And I guess part of the point I wanted to make here is, well, it's very difficult to depict people realistically, convincingly. The problem is, anything you get wrong will really stand out because we're very good at looking at faces and images of people and, and, and we're very good at recognizing that. And we have, there's a lot of hardwired you know, brain cells to analyze those images. Now, if you, go with a, if you try to aim for photorealism, there's all this information that you have to get right. So just take a look at the person sitting next to you, if you don't mind. Go ahead and do that. And you can see there's a lot of information. There's a lot of detail in the skin. There's, subtle, there's a lot of subtle shape there. And the light will reflect off that. And you can see that. You clearly see that. Not only skin, but there's like these little hairs, which I can easily see without having to put my nose right up there. So there's all this stuff. And, and if, you, if you go toward realism, but then start leaving off those things, then that looks weird. It looks like they shaved their arm, which is, might be a weird thing to do, and, and so on. So when you go, if you look at this, look at the skin and compare that to the cloth on the arm. There's almost, it's just, there's nothing there. There's a, you get some sense of shading by this, the shading strokes that are drawn, but in the lighter areas, there's not subtle gradations of tone. It's just white on the skin there and on the shirt there. And yet, we still perceive cloth and skin as distinct things. And yet, there's, the actual image doesn't have it in there. So we're, we're reading a lot into this. So I, part of the point of the work I've embarked on is people are going to want to, when they, when they make computer graphic images and animations, they're going to want to have at their disposal the option, at least, to go with stylized depictions because 
Well, one, it might communicate better for the, whatever the purpose might be, telling the story or, or so forth. But two, it might be a lot easier for the modeler. That's true in regular images, I mean handmade images. So I just recently finished my PhD and I actually had a thesis for my PhD thesis, which is that, that it's quite plausible that we can take what people know for, what artists and illustrators know for, for communicating visually, and we can apply that to computer graphics, and the goal there is both to create new kinds of images that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise, but also to ease the burden for the people who are creating the images. And so that sounds like, yeah, plausible, but it also opens up a lot of research problems. And Primarily, I think the problem is providing the tools so that artists or illustrators or, or people with some skill and people who want to create stylized scenes, who have something in their mind they want to create, you need to pr provide tools for them to do that. So the, the work in my PhD thesis addressed aspects of this central problem. And by no means have I you know, solved this problem. I'm still working on this and many people will be working on this for a long time. Now, I'll just briefly say what I'll cover here, it's just parts of what I did in my PhD. Actually, some of this was not in the, the thesis, and some of this is new. So I'll talk about a paper from SIGGRAPH 97, in which we, I'll just focus on the, the issue of rendering silhouettes, and then a follow-up paper that will be presented at the NPAR conference in June, and that's work I did with uh, J.D. Northrup, who's an undergrad at Brown. And then I'll, I, I have to shorten this talk, actually, so I'm gonna skip over, really, the SIGGRAPH 99 paper, that's art-based rendering where we targeted Dr. Seuss kind of scenes and we did that in 3D. I'll briefly skip over that and, and go straight on to a follow-up paper which will again be at the MPAR conference in June where, where we address the same sort of issue but we um, did some things differently. Address some of the problems in, of our original system from last summer. And I need to make clear, of course, that this is joint work. I didn't do any of this by myself. So I've worked with Michael Kowalski on most of these papers, J.D. Northup also on most of these papers, uh, Sam Trikin, Lubo Bordev, Dan Goldstein, who are undergrads at Brown who worked on that first paper, Lauren Holden, who's a staff researcher at Brown, Ronan Barzell, who works at Pixar, I'm sure many of you know of him, Barb Meyer, who's now at Brown, and John F. Hughes, who's my advisor and collaborator on all this. So I'm gonna talk about, in the first part of the talk, talk about just a very sort of sub-problem within non-photorealistic rendering, which is drawing silhouettes. So I guess maybe I should just say briefly what a silhouette is. If you look at the image on the lower left, the black outline on that nut is the silhouette. So it's, it's the boundary between the front-facing part of the surface and the back-facing part. And there's been some work in, in rendering simple line drawings which we focus on silhouettes, for one thing. And basically, those, the work that's been done falls into two categories. You could call them object space and image space. So in object space, what we do is we detect the silhouettes of the object actually out there in 3D on the model, and then we draw that as 3D curves, 3D lines. And the image space approach is to, that's actually, uh, the image that you see there is from the, the paper by Sa Saito and Takahashi, SIGGRAPH 90. And what they did is they rendered a 3D model into the frame buffer and then read the pixels into memory and then did image processing on the pixels as well as the depth values. And they come up with images like this so for a kind of technical illustration effect in which they're interested in emphasizing the, what's more important in de-emphasizing other kind of subtle shading cues. So now I'm gonna talk about just one part of the problem of drawing silhouettes, which is if you're working, if you're taking an object space approach, you need to first detect the silhouettes, then proceed from there. So here I'll talk about how we detect silhouettes. And of course there's a simple and a very effective algorithm to do that, which is check each edge. I'm assuming you're, you're working on a polyhedral model. So check each edge, and you can t detect, it's a simple computation, to tell if that's a silhouette edge. And that works great. But it is kind of slow. Uh, well, yeah, you have to check every edge and you have to do this every frame because silhouettes are view dependent. So there's some overhead there. And it, it, it's, it can be the biggest cost you have if you're doing these kind of renderings. 
But there's a key observation, and this was part of that first paper that I mentioned from SIGGRAPH 97. And you can use this to develop a, a faster algorithm. So the observation is that you never find a silhouette edge just sitting there by itself. It's always connected to at least two more, one on either end. And that's a simple enough thing to prove. And the other observation is that the silhouette edges tend to, uh, uh, under small changes of the camera, which you normally have, say, in an animation or an interactive session, typically the silhouette edges in a given frame will, some of those at least, will have been silhouette edges in the previous frame. So there's a kind of temporal coherence. They're not just completely randomly changing from one frame to the next. So based on those observations, we developed this randomized algorithm, which is pretty simple, it's easy to code, and it works, pretty w works very well. And I just wanted to go over this and explain how it works. So what we do is we just check a fraction of all edges, not checking all of them, just check a small fraction, and I'll say more about what that fraction is. But then whenever you, occasionally, once in a long while, you get lucky and you finally hit a silhouette edge, and when that happens, you know there's going to be one more on either end. So we go and we get those two. And then since we found these extra two, we can expect to find more on the other ends of those, unless it formed a little loop. So we go on and we, we keep finding the silhouette edges, continuing that until we've got all of the silhouette edges connected to that original one. And then we go back and we continue with this checking a small fraction of the entire edges. And that way, whenever you hit part of a long silhouette chain of edges, you'll always get all the edges in that. And then for step two, we also check any edge that we knew was a silhouette edge in the previous frame. We always make sure we just look at those in this frame because many times they still will be silhouette edges. And I'd like to say something about how well this performs. But to do that, I have to kind of narrow things down. I, I wanted to say something about the running time. So I'd like to say, as the number of edges increases, how does this algor algorithm perform? But if, if, if I increase the number of edges by just swapping in completely different models every time, then it's going to be really hard to say anything meaningful. So I'm going to restrict this. I'm going to say, let's say we have some smooth model, maybe a spline surface, for example, or a subdivision surface. And we have, we can, we have some kind of refinement scheme where I can tessellate with a polyhedral approximation. I can tessellate that smooth surface to better and better accuracy using more and more triangles. And so an example of a refinement scheme would be where each triangle, as you see there, is split into four triangles in that way. And now, I also want to assume that as we do this, you, look, you can look at this, the model, as you progressively refine with more and more triangles, and that you can you can sort of pick out a silhouette edge, uh, sorry, a silhouette curve in the initial refinement and then sort of track it visually over multiple refinements. And you should, so you can identify one, the silhouette over multiple refinements. All right, now I want to assume that the number of edges in a given chain of silhouettes doubles each time we do this. And that's plausible if you look, I don't know if you can tell the colors here, the, the yellow edge there on the right of the top triangle turns into two edges when you do this refinement scheme. And so this actually would be the case if we simply just split the triangles without any smoothing, then, then these conditions would hold. So in that case, I can claim and prove that I can maintain a desired probability of detecting a given silhouette chain, which I'm tracking over these multiple refinements, by checking just order of the square root of n number of edges, where n is the number of edges. Now, I'm not sure if I should really, yeah, this is really simple, so I just, I will do this. Uh, I'll just take you through this. This is the entire thing right here, so it's, it's really not that bad. So I want to prove that that's true, and I want to show you why it's true. So I've got some variables. N is the number of edges, and we're, we're looking at a particular silhouette chain, so it's a collection of silhouette edges that are connected, and we can track that over multiple refinements. And the number of edges in the silhouette chain is S. So Every time n increases by a factor of four, s is going to double. And then I want to check some number of edges in the model to look for silhouette. So I'm going to call that number c. And because the number of edges in the silhouette chain is doubling while the total number of edges is quadrupling, 
it's not very hard to show that s varies with the square root of n. So it's some constant beta times the square root of n. And, and if we had more time, I'd show you. It's a simple calculation to choose beta. It's determined. And then let's just take c, the number of edges to check, just make that vary with the square root of n with some constant alpha to be determined. Then let's talk about what is the probability that we miss the chain of silhouette edges entirely. So what's happening here is we've got all the edges in the model there, and we're gonna randomly pick one and examine it to see if it's a silhouette edge. It may or may not be. If it is, we'll follow it all around to, to get all the remaining edges that are connected to it. If it's not, then we just miss. And then we, we don't do anything fancy like take it out of the list. We just leave it there and we try again. We do this repeatedly, C times. So to miss the chain, we would have to miss it every single time, C times in a row. So what's the probability that we miss it one time we, on just a single check? Well, there's n edges in, in all. There's n minus s that are not in the chain. So the probability of hitting one of those that is not in the chain is n minus s over n. But we have to just do this again and again and again, c times in a row. We have to miss it every time. So the probability of that happening is simply n minus s over n to the, to the c power. Is this clear? I don't want to lose everyone. So it's, it's really not that complicated. So now I simply substitute in what I'd written for s and c, and then do a simple cancellation here. And I get this last expression, which you, some of you may recognize. In my case, I had to look it up. But in a calculus book, it's fairly basic in calculus. This expression in the limit as n increases to infinity approaches what you see there, e, or one over e to the power alpha times beta. And it approaches it from the bottom, so it's increasing up to that, but always staying below that. So we can just re rephrase this. That was the probability of missing. So the probability of hitting the chain is always greater than this fixed constant amount. And this, that's the proof. So it maintain a probability of at least a, a fixed amount by checking order of square root of n edges. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's something to do with translation from my other PowerPoint file to this one, I guess, because it was there before. <laughs> right. OK, so, so one nice thing about doing that little analysis is that it actually tells you something else about the algorithm. It tells you how you can choose that constant alpha, which I said, you know, I left it sort of un, undefined for a while. So just as an example, let's say your mesh at the very lowest refinement, so it's very coarse, has only 128 edges, and, and you've got, say, the outer silhouette, perhaps, or some silhouette that you're interested in has eight edges, and we want to detect that with a probability of 95%, then it's basically straightforward, I guess I'm not going to go through it all exactly, but it comes out to be a little over four. Is, uh, so you've got, you got to test slightly over four times the square root of n as you go to higher refinements, and you will always maintain a probability of you basically miss it one out of 20 times. Now, missing it one out of 20 times would be terrible because you'd see it on the screen and every now and then it would drop out briefly and come back in and that would really be awful. But everything I talked about here ignored that second step of the randomized algorithm where we check the edges from the previous frame. And adding that in, which really has no cost, just makes this work in such a way that we never see them dropping out once they come in. So the worst that happens is occasionally, as you move the camera, a small silhouette, not the big outer one, which you, always, you just always find it, but sometimes little small things like the tip of a nose if you're looking right at it, you, know, you might have some small silhouette. Occasionally that will come in a few beats late, you know, a couple frames late. But once it's in, you don't lose it again. So, so how can you use this? Well, <laughs> it's kind of a strange slide. I just wanted to cram everything on here. But so one use would be a simple kind of fast line drawing style. And that's what you see in the lower right. You just detect the silhouettes, the silhouette edges, as I said, and then just draw them just in OpenGL or whatever you like. And then draw the, the triangles of the model as well in OpenGL, in this case without any shading. And you get something like that. It looks like a simple kind of line drawing. And this is very low overhead. The actual cost of, of detecting the silhouettes in this way is comparable for models about this complicated or, and more complicated. It, it's basically 
takes less time than drawing the triangles. So you're, really not, you're adding very little. You basically don't notice the overhead of detecting the silhouettes this way. For a model with, say, 100,000 triangles, the savings you get by the randomized algorithm I described is something on the order of 60, factor of 60 speed up. So it goes from being, it would have been the, the most, your biggest cost, it goes to being neg negligible. Basically, don't, are not aware of it. So that's one application, a kind of simple line drawing style. Another would be for visualization. So you can compare the, the upper right to the lower left. So the lower left, you have wireframe, which it can be good if you want to see the triangles, I guess, but it can also be very confusing. There's too many triangles. And if, you're, if you want to use this to sort of see through something, then this turns out to be quite useful to be able to just draw the silhouettes like that. So you still s clearly see that there's that shape there, but you can also see clearly what's behind it. And we use this in a, in a modeling system that we've developed at Brown, where we need to get at something that's inside of another surface. We draw the, the outer surface in this silhouette style, and then we can just click, I mean, we can then grab things. You can grab whatever you can see, so we could then, we could, for example, grab the cylinder at the part that would be occluded otherwise. Yeah? Why is the surface head plate not completely closed? Or I mean, why is it broken into two segments? It's like, or there's like a floating segment there. And you see, you know, in the center of the head, there's a floating segment. I'm just wondering why that didn't connect around. Oh, um, so I just found it. Well, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but you can get things like that all the time in silhouettes. You, you can get little set. They don't have to be connected to the larger silhouette. My question was related to that. Your randomized algorithm at the bottom level has check if it's a silhouette, if it's edge. Does that have to do with the direction of the normal at the, that point on the mesh? Yeah, yeah I, I just I was skipping over the details, but that's fine. Um, well, I, I asked because this, a student I've been working with has gaps like the one Brian just pointed out, and it has something to do with how fine the polygon mesh is and whether the normal really indi indicates that it's a silhouette edge or not. Hmm. So is, is there a problem at that level at all of whether it really well, is or not? Could it get the wrong answer at that bottom level? No, it's pretty easy to define it in a way that, that will work. Basically, the silhouette edge lies between a front-facing triangle and a back-facing triangle. And whether it's front-facing or back-facing is a simple test using a dot product. With so, this so why is there a gap in that? Well, one, one, one thing that might be a little confusing to people looking at that top right is that these are all the edges drawn with, without regard to what's actually visible. You compare it to the bottom right, the, the parts that are occluded are now covered up because I drew the solid triangle and I used you know, normal Z buffering. So anything that's behind some other thing else will be covered up and you won't see it. But that's what the solid edges look like if you draw them all without removing the occluded parts. Now, I, I mentioned you could do a simple line drawing style, but if we'd like to add stylization, there's some problems. You, it turns out you just can't turn on Z buffering and add your stylization and, and hope things will work. And here's the reason. Well, because this is from a, this is rendered with, from a 3D model, but the 3D model is not irregular in this way. It's, some of you might recognize this model. It's been in a variety of cigarette papers from here, from University of Washington. So at any rate, it's straight for the most part. It's very regular, but we've just made the lines wiggly, kind of irregular as a stylization. But when you do that, you don't know what depth values to give to the lines where it's departing from the literal geometry. So Z buffering won't work. Like where the wiggles sort of come in, they will get covered up by the triangles that are there. And that's not what you want. Uh, another kind of problem, if you added stylization like this, where we've tried to sort of smear a texture map to get an effect of a stroke, as you would like a brush stroke, we use this with, we did this with a texture map. But the the inner edge of the stroke with Z buffering would get sort of cut off by the triangles there. With it, and uh, you'd get an uneven, kind of jaggy border, and it wouldn't look like what you wanted, and that would be a problem as well. And there's, well, that suggests that you should know visibility, so that you don't have to turn on Z buffering, and you, you just know where the visible parts are, and then just draw those. You know they're visible, so you draw them. No depth testing, but you just add the stylization then. And that's what we did for that 97 paper, and it, it was it worked okay, but there was some problems which 
I guess we might have glossed over. I don't know if we talked about it or not. <laughs> but now I'll talk about it because we have a new paper that addresses them. <laughs> now I hope we didn't gloss over, I just don't remember. But here's, here's something that you see a lot. So down in the lower right, or lower left, sorry, it's supposed to look like just kind of hills, so a couple hills there. And we see this pattern of the, the silhouette just stops. And in fact, what happens is there's an occluded part of the silhouette that cuts back, and then it cuts forward again, and then it comes out from behind the, the, the hill that's in front. And that same little pattern is going to occur at all scales, it turns out, on these silhouette, chains of silhouette edges. So it occurs on this large scale in the order of hills, but at any little point that you might pick out where you don't see that happening, it turns out microscopically it's still happening. It happens everywhere at tiny scales as well as at large scales. Now if you just use visibility and say, I'm going to detect where it goes in and out of visibility and start, start the strokes when it emerges into visibility and stop the strokes where it goes out of visibility, then what would happen is your stroke would have to stop at that place where that happened. And that's not the only place, by the way. It would be happening all around. And it would, your stroke would always be broken up. You'd get little, little tiny bits of strokes. But visually, it doesn't make sense. So you don't want the stroke to stop just because there's a microscopic break. It's not really a much of a break in visibility. So that's, it would be a, unsatisfactory if, if that's all you could do. So this is this new paper that I mentioned that J.D. Northrup did most of the work on. I mean, so I should give credit there. And that will be at MPAR. And it, were, <coughs> it addresses that problem. Uh, as well as the problem of finding, determining what's visible and also doing a kind of processing to eliminate those breaks in visibility. So it works as follows. First, just detect the silhouette edges. So that's an object space operation. Then we do a kind of an image space processing to uh, find where the visible parts of the silhouettes are and then to correct for those little breaks in visibility and basically glue the strokes together, or what's going to be the strokes. And finally, apply stylization and draw the strokes. And in order to talk about it, I, I should just briefly talk about this ID reference image, which we use in, in our algorithm. And this, this is actually familiar to, to many graphics people. It goes way back. I think there's a paper that discussed this in the 80s. But at any rate, briefly, you, you choose a unique color for each of your mesh elements, so for each triangle or each edge that you intend to draw. And the color is essentially can tell you, can give you back a pointer to that element. And, and then you draw with these colors in, in such a way that you don't do any blending or use lighting or anything like that. So you, you preserve the colors exactly. And then we read the pixels into memory. And then in code, we can then access that memory. So for example, given an image space location, we can look at the corresponding pixel in this ID reference image find the color and directly look up and find, oh, that's from this triangle right here, which is part of this model, and which is associated with this other information that I stored on this triangle, and so forth. So using that, I'll now sort of go into the algorithm in a bit more detail. So I mentioned we detect the silhouette edges, and then the three middle steps are where we do this processing. And lastly, we then we draw the resulting stroke paths. So, First, we determine the little segments of each edge that are visible. So we're not concerned yet with linking them together to form nice long paths. And then we do a correction step where we get rid of some of these little segments. And lastly, we then connect them up into long paths, or not lastly, second to last, and finally draw them with stylization. So to determine the segments, so <laughs> what you're seeing here is an edge of your model which has been occluded by some weird shape that's here in the foreground. And so there's three separate visible parts of the edge. And what we do is we look in the ID reference image. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that we draw the model with the triangles. Uh, you could draw them with their ID colors if you like, although it doesn't really matter. You could just draw them black if you wanted. But then we, we detect the silhouette edges and we draw them with their ID colors. And then when we, when we look in the ID reference image, we see the pixels that came from silhouette edges. And then we, for each such, for each edge that showed up at all, we determine the, the separate distinct parts of it in this way. And I'm, I, I won't go into the nitty gritty stuff because it's, basically you understand the concept, I think, if, just from the schematic diagram. 
So in this case, we would have pixels from that first portion, which are to get, which are adjacent, and then there's a break, and there's no pixels for a while, and then some pixels from the edge are showing up again in that middle portion, and so forth. So we, at the end of this phase, we've determined that there's three segments, which are parts of an edge, but they're parts that are actually showing up in the visible image. And then there's this correction step, and what we're doing here is, well, look at the one on the right first. If you have two segments that are very close and very much parallel, but one is shorter, then in that case, we just eliminate the shorter one. And similarly, if we have two edges that are very close and nearly parallel, you, more parallel than in the diagram, but this is for just to kind of show, because it's easier to sort of make out what's going on. Then in that case, we'll sort of merge them together, in that case. So this, this would address that, the problem that I pointed out, that we have this microscopic little structure of stopping, cutting back, and coming back out again. Basically, it would glue that together, and there would no longer be a break there. And then, following that, we now have all these little bits of edges that are, that are determined to have shown up in the image. So these are the visible parts. And each segment comes from some edge. And now we just want to chain them together, link them all up to form paths. And again, this is pretty simple stuff. We just do that as long as they, they don't form much of an angle. So if they're pretty much continuing on without any sharp turn, then we go ahead and link them up. And there are some other details. Like sometimes there's actually a choice. You could go this way or that way. But we just use heuristics to, to try to choose the best overall linking. So up to this point, now we have where we want to draw the strokes, and we sort of determine where the strokes need to be, but the last step now is apply some kind of stylization. And this is based on, I mean, this is pretty much a lot like what was done with the skeletal strokes work from, I guess, Sue and others. There was a, there's a couple of papers on this, WIS 93 and I think SIGGRAPH 94. But the basic idea, and in our case it's even simpler than what they did, but the basic idea is you, you start with some kind of stroke path that determines the stroke goes along like this, and at this point, we're not even considering little wiggles, which you could separate out as a stylization. And in addition to the stroke path, we've also chosen a varying width for the stroke, marked by like little crossbars. So what we do now is just construct a triangle strip, which is very straightforward from that. And then we can add some stylizations, as you see here. So the strokes there on the right are just done, generated in this way in OpenGL. So the very first one, starting from left to right, just shows a triangle strip drawn without any further processing. And you can see it's got the jaggy edges. It's not that nice. So obviously one thing to do is just anti-alias it. And one, one thing you can do is just, I mean, you can anti-alias the polygons, but that's more overhead than you really need because we don't need the inner edge, the, the interior edges don't need to be anti-aliased. So what we do is we just draw an anti-aliased GL line strip right around the boundary. It's very fast, and the hardware supports it very well. So that's a bit nicer, but still not much of a stroke. Another thing you can do is taper the ends, or round them off in this case. Another thing you can do is apply flare, as JD calls it, which is just varying the width along the strokes according to some function. So it starts on one end thick and then tapers off to the other, to the other end. You can add wiggles, so some kind of offsets that add these wiggles. You can apply that either to the central path or to the widths or both. And that's what you see there. And then you can, just as we vary the width along the stroke, we can also vary the color or the alpha so that second to last stroke is done that way. And lastly, you could actually use some kind of texture map. So you could take like a, bl a sort of blurry black dot and smear it out along the stroke, and you get an effect like that. And let's see, I'm about to show you some video, but I guess there are people who are looking at this from elsewhere, who might, on their computers, in fact. And for those people, you're better off looking at the animations just right off the internet, and you can go there. You can also just search for my name, Lee Markosian, and uh, it's not a common name, so you'll find my homepage. And from there, go to research, and it should be straightforward. So this is a still that we did with our system. And I'll show some of the animations. I'm going to switch to video for this. <laughs> 
Whoops. All right, so this is just a comparison. The, the one that, <coughs> that's got all the aliasing is just done with regular GL lines, and you can see that that was not as good. Now, by the way, as you'll see, there are still issues of temporal coherence, so it's not as if we solved that. And I can say a little bit more about that. Um, one problem is that if you're applying stroke stylization, typically you use the parameterization of the stroke. That is, the stroke has a beginning and an end, and you can parameterize it, say, from zero to one, going from the beginning to end. But as you go to multiple frames, the silhouettes are changing, and it's hard to come up with a consistent parameterization. Well, it's actually hard to come up with any kind of correspondence between silhouettes in general. So that we haven't addressed that problem at all. We've just, in this case, the, the issue of the parameterization doesn't really come up because it's mostly the same all the way along. All right. Let's see. Whoops. All right, well, this is the QuickTime version. So let's see. You've already seen these, so. All right, so just to conclude on this work, um, this works at interactive rates, if you can consider a few frames a second interactive. Up to 10, though. It depends on how many silhouettes you actually end up with. Um, the 10 is, is made, it doesn't really get faster than 10, at least on our test machines, because there's a lot of overhead in just reading pixels out of the frame buffer. That turns out to be slow on, on, on much of the good graphics hardware. So this is definitely an improvement on unprocessed silhouettes. And, but as I said, well, I don't know if I said this, but the strokes can still get broken up in places where you wouldn't really expect them to. So, and that's one source of the temporal incoherence. And as I said, we didn't address the parameterization at all. So, and that, you really need to do that in some way in order to have true temporal coherence. And also, those demos, we're not done with any extra annotation. There's just load in a model, choose a stroke style, and run it. So, in fact, if you wanted to make nice graphics, you really probably should annotate your models to say, you know, not, don't just draw the silhouette edges, but also draw some of the other important edges, like on a cube, to take a simple example. The sharp edges are significant, and you probably need to draw something there, whether or not they're silhouettes. All right, so that was the first half of the talk, but I'm supposed to wrap up really soon. So I'm going to skip over, I'm going to talk about some new stuff, but this is from our, from the, art-based rendering paper from last summer, where we, we looked at pictures, say, by Dr. Seuss and others, and we said, let's talk about how to do this in 3D graphics. And this is what our results looked like. And I guess I'll just show the video and then talk about some improvements that we made since then. So I'm gonna skip over all this stuff and go to the video. Okay. <coughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> This is the wrong video, that's why. That was the, <laughs> that was the improved version. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to apologize for the video quality. Uh, on screen, it's much nicer than, than what we ended up with because this got, I don't know, whatever the reason was. But, so the model itself doesn't have the, the fur details. Those are generated view dependently, each frame. And they're, because of the nature of this particular style that we're targeting, the, what we need them in a given frame is mostly around silhouettes. And that's a view dependent thing. So we also need more if we're up close, and we need fewer if you're farther back. So it's, it evaluates where these little detail elements need to be placed, places them just within that frame, and then when it goes to the next frame, it attempts to reuse any detail elements that it can from the previous frame, but only as long as they're still usable. So if they're too far from a silhouette, say, it would stop using them, or if there's too many crowded in the close area, it would get rid of some of them. So again, the model itself does, has no, none of these little detail things, and part of the 
the idea there is that you're saving some work from the person creating this. At least in, <coughs> there's the potential to do that. And again, you can see that the bushes have more leaves when you get close, and there's fewer leaves when you back up. And this is actually captured live off the screen. This is, this, that's the frame rates we were getting for our test machine. And when we render it offline, you'll see, oh my god, the temporal coherence is really awful. And it's not as noticeable here because it's only about five frames a second or four frames a second. So here's where it's awful. And there's a couple sources of the problem, which I'll talk more about. But one thing is when, when anything is introduced here, it's introduced just all at once, suddenly. And whenever, when it's taken away, it just yanks right out. This is something we tried where we said, OK, let's just fade them in and fade them out. And it's still not very nice. It's a little better. I think some of the details, like the, the leaves, might work a little better than the grass, perhaps. OK, now, just if you look at the, these truffula trees, and look at the one in the back, because it's going to change. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, other than that change, it's actually awfully coherent. All right, well, there's one more, but I'll stop there. <coughs> so other than that change, it was awfully coherent. And that's because we're using a different method. And so in, our, in this newer paper, which will be at MPAR, we're going with this, this other method, which we're calling statically placed graftals. That means the, so the graftals are the detail elements, the leaves or the pieces of fur, and these are in the newer system, they're just placed all at one, you know, ahead of time in an annotation step. And then they may or may not be drawn. But I guess I'm jumping ahead. I should talk about so the problems. Well, I mentioned, uh, and you saw for yourself, the uh, temporal coherence issues. And that comes from a few sources. One is that we were <coughs> introducing and eliminating graphics a little more than we really needed to. You'd see sometimes where something would go away and then Shortly after, something very much like it would appear in almost the same place, and then it might go away again. And really, it could have gotten by with just leaving it there. That's one problem. And another problem is when it is introduced, it's just all at once. Also, these things, they, they have like little subtle levels of detail. So a given little detail element itself can draw in a few different ways. And, and there were just distinct ways that it could draw, and it, it wouldn't transition smoothly. Another problem is that it was hard to create these things. That each new uh, shape of leaf or whatever had to be uh, defined by writing code and then compiling the code and restarting. <laughs> so in our newer framework, we've gotten away from that. And, and so all these scenes in the newer framework are described by just, uh, well, it's not that ideal still. We're editing text files now, which is better. And the goal, though, is to get to where we have a user interface to directly sort of sketch out what you want to see in the end. And the interface would then, I guess, be writing these text files, which our system now reads. So the framework is based on uh, everything comes down to drawing primitives. And these are just strokes, as I talked about previously, as well as even simpler things, which are just surfaces like a triangle strip or collections of triangle strips. So these are examples of graftals. So graftals are composed of drawing primitives. So you can have a triangle strip for this tuft of fur and then draw some strokes around the boundary. So that's three primitives there, one triangle strip, two strokes. And the leaf has more strokes, I guess, and probably maybe two triangle strips. And there's also a notion of tufts. So a tuft is a kind of compound graftal that has multiple graftals, but they're organized in some kind of hierarchy. So in this case, <coughs> this is the same thing you're looking at, a schematic representation. But on the left, it's showing you at a lower level of detail. So perhaps you're looking at it from farther away. So it only needs to show one, so one of these, whatever these things are. And as you go to the right, I mean, as you come in closer, it shows additional graftals. So first I'll talk a little bit about basic graftals. As I mentioned, they're a collection of drawing primitives. And I don't know if this is a, I might skip over the idea of the canonical vertices, just because I know I'm low on time. But so each basic graftal is defined with a set of points that the drawing primitives refer to. And the, the set of points are defined in some just uh, generic canonical space. And then the, each specific graftal then gets placed in a particular position on some surface. So then it has to map from its canonical space onto that surface. And that's what this slide is about. So you've got your canonical space, just 
very generic. And then you put this grass sole, which might be a leaf or some blades of grass or something like that, put that on a surface so it has a position, and it also has a coordinate frame. We typically use the surface normal and some other direction. So in this case, that x direction could be chosen using a little procedure where we take into account the, the vector from the camera to the graph cell position and do a cross product with the surface normal to get the vector x. So, and that will tend to line up along silhouettes. So we've used that for some of our examples. And then, so what the, to create a scene in this way, what we do is create a few example graph cells, and then we just distribute copies of them over a surface. And you can actually do that explicitly. You say, I want them here and here and here. Or you can just say, give me a bunch of them on this surface, space them out reasonably. So we had a few choices on how to do that. And as you do this copying and placing on the surfaces, we can also introduce a little variation in, the, in the, all the parameters of the graph tool. So this is an example where I think we had three example graph tools for the leaves. And then we just distribute them over this underlying shape, which is the blobby thing. And <coughs> Then when, when we render, we, we may or may not draw a given graph tool. So in the very center of the bush where it's facing toward you, you don't see any leaves there. That's because there are leaves there, but they're not drawing themselves at this time. They've determined it was not appropriate to draw. But near the silhouettes, they're drawing. And if you see sort of in between, the leaves are drawn a little bit. You notice that? So what happens is if we move the camera around, those will sort of increase or decrease. They'll either drop out altogether or they'll increase and be more fully defined leaves. So I guess I should be really wrapping up. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> still have to show the, the videos too. So, so we had to deal with the whole issue of level of detail. How do you choose for the graph tool? What is it drawing or whether or not it's drawing at all? And to do that, we, we come up with some number that quantifies how much this graph tool should be drawing. So that's, uh, we're going to call that lambda for level of detail. And there's three numbers in turn that we use to determine lambda. So I'll go, go through these right now. So sigma has to do with size, rho has to do with orientation. So sigma size. So the designer would start by designing a graph tool, say the, the one that you, with all the detail, that the one you see there on the right, but then they'll say, Typically on screen, I expect it to be about this size. Like that would be about the right level to be looking at it. And, and then if it turns out for a given view, it's much smaller than that because the camera is farther back, then we can measure that. We can say, well, it's only 70% you know, of its sort of target size. So this number sigma is that ratio, in this case 0.7. So it's a reduced level of detail is indicated. Or on the other extreme, a greater level of detail because it's bigger than you were expecting. And you can set things up so that some of the details only show up when this value gets large enough. And then for, for rho, it has something to do with orientation, but it's kind of open to how you use that specifically. That's how we achieve this, this effect where the leaves that are on the surface facing toward you in the center of the bush, those leaves don't get drawn because they're being suppressed there because of this rho calculation. So in this example, we just take the dot product of the surface normal with the vector from the eye and take one minus that, essentially. So we'll get t tend to get zero in the interior surface where the normals are pointing toward you, and we tend to get one near the silhouettes. And then we just interpret this as a kind of modulation factor. So if it's near one, it's saying, go ahead, it's okay to draw as long as your other values are saying it's, it's good. But if, it, if this row is near zero, it's saying no, like suppress how much you want to draw. So that's, like, that's pretty simple. Um, I might skip over the specific details of tufts. We, we organize the different, uh, so a tuft is this composite graph tool organized into levels. So in this case, there's two levels. In the very first level, that's the center graph tool, that will always be drawn but the other two may not. And so the other two are, are just shown there on the right as solid, solid outlines just to identify them. The two graph tools together are in that second level. So in general, a level can have multiple graph tools. And I'll, I'll skip over some of this exact details, but as we switch levels, <laughs> we introduce some new level that hadn't been previously drawn, we need to have some transition time to allow something to 
smooth, you know, some smooth transition to bring it in in some way. And that's what this tau is all about. So for example, you might say, when I introduce those second, the secondary graphdols off on the sides, I want a, a transition time of, say, three quarters of a second to, to introduce those. Or I guess in my example, it's 0.8 seconds. Let's see, is that what I said? Right. So over 0.8 seconds, we're going to bring these things in. And we just check how much time has elapsed since that level was turned on. If it was 0.6 seconds, then we'll, we're 0.75 of the way there. So that's just pretty, pretty simple stuff. And then that number just sort of tells you where you are at in the transition. And you can use that to scale it, to grow it from small to, to big as it goes from 0 to 1, or to do other things as well. You can actually morph it or change its color. Or, or there's a, a bunch of things we can do. So, all right. <coughs> and you put in these numbers together. One way to do that is simply multiply them. But we, I'll skip over the specific details. There's various choices you can make. So yeah, now, well, I guess this QuickTime can play up here. It might just be better if I show it on the video, though. So I'll do that. All right, well, this was just for comparison. <coughs> I don't think it's entirely successful. You see that the truculus tufts are sort of splitting open. Oh, whoops. Sort of splitting open and growing out. So here's another example. I don't know how well this comes across. I guess, yeah, I would encourage you to look at it on the web page to, to really see it more clearly. I think it'll show twice, so we're, partway through the first time here. Um, so one thing about this is it helps to watch it a few times and pick out something to, to, to track visually and try to see when the changes occur because otherwise you can tend to miss a lot of it. <laughs> Another thing I'll point out is look at the pine trees here on the, on the left and these things are growing in. See this? Now I personally think that that was not a successful choice but all the, all the policies of how the transitions occur are, are basically open. That's not a question that our algorithm answers. We have a, an arc director, in this case it was Barb Meyer who created this scene, who's making those choices. Oh. I, actually, I won't show this one because it's kind of silly. <laughs> all right, you saw it. This took her 15 minutes, she said. It was just a silly thing that she did. Oh, we're back on this. Okay, so, so quickly, some conclusions. It's certainly more flexible with this new framework. You don't have to write code, and it, we kind of unified things. So it's easier to make new kinds of graph tools and also to control the behavior. And we have much more choices now for how, how we do these transitions. We actually have choices about it. So the scene designer can, can exercise those. Now there's some downsides. One is, we sort of gave up on one of the nice things about the original system, which was that when the, the bush in the original system goes behind you, then there's no effort anymore spent on drawing that. Well, other than drawing it into the reference image, which is very easy to do. It's, that's just using display lists and so forth. But the actual work of processing graph tools is only done on the graph tools that are showing up in the picture. Whereas now, we're still drawing the leaves when they go behind you. And basically, we should be culling, and we weren't doing that. So, as of now, it's slower. And also, I, I'm sure that our specific approach to how we handle level detail is clearly not the, you know, the final word on it. I mean, there's, there's some significant limitations, things that we'd like to be able to do and ought to be able to do, which don't quite work out in, in this. So this is something I'm, we're still planning to work on. So speaking of general, uh, future work, <coughs> I just mentioned generalize that level of detail issue. And, uh, and then the rest of it, it has to do with putting together the, this final system that lets you create these things from scratch, stylize scenes more generally. So one is a user interface to let you directly sketch the graphicals and where they are and what they look like. As, as, as to how you actually deal with their behavior, that's 
you can't really sketch the behavior, I don't think. So I mean, I'm not sure what we'll do for that. Now, <coughs> what seems like a very separate thing is a user interface to sketch the shapes themselves. And I've done some work on this problem, and I'm still continuing with that. And another <coughs> sort of avenue for research is not just graph those, but say shading strokes or painterly strokes. We'd like to have a user interface to let someone directly draw shading strokes and, and actually use what you draw to then reproduce the rendering from different viewpoints. And so part of the future work is to do all this and put it in one system so you actually can create the geometry and then put on the fur or the graph or add the shading strokes and end up with a stylized scene that wasn't there and hopefully do it quickly. So this is not a particularly great drawing, which I made. And part of the reason I'm showing it to you is that it, aside from whatever lack of skill I might have, I didn't work at it too hard either. It's kind of simple, crude. But this is the kind of thing that you know, people routinely can draw and it's not hard. It's really hard to make even the geometry that you can imagine here. Really hard, I, I would say, to make that with conventional modeling systems. So part of the goal is to, to, to make it almost as easy as it would be to draw and to leverage the skills you have for drawing if you have any. And then, well, for those who have them, it's good to leverage. So the other thing though is if I, if we got that far but we just had to render it with conventional methods, I don't think it would be very satisfying to do this as Gros shaded, say, or even if you added texture mapping, it's just not the same kind of effect. So it's easy enough to draw these, these hat, hatching lines and it adds, its, I don't know, has a quality to it that's there in the drawing. And we'd like to take those, draw, those lines as you draw them and t make them be the basis for an algorithm that then generates shading strokes from novel viewpoints, but retaining that same character. And that is the end of the talk. Thank <laughs> you.